we spent the last month dealing with missions and listening to mission speakers tell about what God has been doing on the various fields where they serve. But why? Why do we spend so much time talking about missions and, and even go into another month as we focus on foreign missions again this month with Lottie Moon Christmas offer? Other than the obvious fact that Jesus told us to do that in Matthew chapter 28, 19, and 20, when he said, Go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you to the end of the age. Why do we do missions? Well, I think if we look at Isaiah chapter 6, we can get a pretty good idea of why we need to do missions. If you have your Bibles and are able to do so, would you stand as we honor the reading of God's Word, beginning with verse 1, chapter 6 of the book of Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up. And the train of His robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two He covered His face. With two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And he cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The post of the door was shaken by the voice of him who cried, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken from the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity has been taken away, and your sin purged. Also I heard the voice the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And then I said, Here am I, send me. Father, I don't know that there is any greater mission challenge than this one in the book of Isaiah. And Isaiah sees the need, responds to a call, and says, here am I, send me. This morning, open our hearts, our minds, our understanding, that you might impress upon us the same thing that was impressed upon the heart of Isaiah, so we might respond to you as well. Hineni, here am I, send me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. When we look at this passage of Scripture, the first thing that we are confronted with is the revelation of God's holiness. If we're going to ever understand why the necessity for missions, I think it has to start with an understanding of God's holiness. That He is set apart from us. Isaiah said in the year that King Uzziah died, a specific time, specific place, a measurable time, he saw the Lord high and lifted up, sitting on his throne. Sitting on his throne. His work was done. The work was finished. But the job had just begun. His work was over. He was finished. He was sitting on the throne in a place of authority and majesty and power. But the work was still needing to be done. He saw the holiness of God. He saw His person sitting on the throne. He saw His position high and lifted up above all others. With no one around to, to even come close to Him and His power and His authority and His majesty. And all of the angels will worship Him crying out about His purity saying, holy, holy, holy. 
is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy. The triune holiness of God. That holiness that indicates the entirety of divine perfection. There is nothing greater than He who sits upon the throne. And His glory fills the earth. It's not just a momentary glory. His glory fills the earth. This past week, there was a big election in Israel. This coming week, there will be a big election here. But these who are elected will only serve for a short period of time. Two, four years, whatever. But in respect of eternity, just a short period of time. And they are elected to serve. But God was never elected to serve. He serves by right of His power, His authority, His position, and His purity. And He serves eternity. From eternity past to eternity future, He serves faithfully. And when we see His holiness the way that we should, there is only one recourse to realize what our condition is as God sees us. You see, it's easy for us to look around and to see ourselves in light of other people. We, we look at our neighbor and say, I'm not as bad as that person. At least I go to church. I don't go out and cut my grass on Sunday afternoon. I don't go out and, and do this and, or do that. I don't participate in this activity. I'm better than he. I'm better than she. We pick up the newspaper and find that somebody has murdered someone else. Just this past week, I heard on the news that there was a drive-by shooting. Several people were killed. And they think that there were several gunmen. And I thought to myself, how wicked of people are there that can just get in a car, drive by a, an undisclosed place, and just shoot you know, indiscriminately out of the window, not caring who gets hit? What kind of world are we living in? I'm better than they are. I wouldn't do that. And you see, if I do that, then I become self-righteous. I become better than they are. And I began to see myself, as I see myself, a pretty good guy. Isaiah, no doubt, thought he was a pretty good guy. He was a prophet. He was serving God. He was doing all the things that God said for him to do. Pretty righteous dude. But when he saw God high and lifted up, his train filling the temple, and the angels ascribing holiness and purity to him, Isaiah had but one response. And that was, Woe is me, for I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. He saw himself as God saw him, as a sinner. Paul said in Romans 3.23, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Some of us may think, well, I'm not a bad sinner. It doesn't matter. You're a sinner. How many laws do you have to break to be a lawbreaker? Only one. How many sins do you have to commit to become a sinner? One. And Paul says all of us have sinned. We were born in sin. David said, in sin my mother conceived me, not in an act, a sinful act, but with the, the nature of sin within him. As I've said so many times before, we don't have to teach children how to misbehave. There's not been a single parent or grandparent that has ever sat down, I don't think, with a child and said, now listen here, Sonny, this is what you do to get in trouble. This is what you do to disobey your mom and dad. This is what you do to, to cause problems. We don't do that. We teach them how to act correctly, but they know automatically how to act incorrectly. We say, well, I'm pretty righteous. I, I, I may sin a little bit, but yeah, I'm not as bad as some people. 
know what God says about that? Isaiah was the one who wrote this. He said, all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. And the word for filthy in that, in that context is the, the word for a rag that has been used, a white, clean, pure rag that has been wrapped around a person with leprosy. Perhaps they wrapped it around their hand and, and up partway their arm, covering all the leprosy sores that were oozing infection. And after a period of time, maybe just a short period of time, that rag had become filthy and needed to be unwrapped and changed out. And that rag was considered filthy beyond reuse. There was no way that that rag was worth even putting into hot boiling water and to boil, to sterilize it, to make it useful again. It was useless and good for nothing from that point on. It was contaminated. And that's what Isaiah said, that our righteousness is in the sight of God. Regardless of how good we may be, of how upstanding and righteous we may consider ourselves, God says our righteousness in his eyes is as nothing more than a filthy, leprosy-filled rag, ready to be thrown into the heap of fire and burned to ashes. That's the way God sees it. And when we see ourselves as God sees us, then we begin to get an understanding of what the world looks like around us, the lostness of the world. Isaiah says, I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Isaiah said, I'm sinful. I, I, I'm a man of unclean lips, but I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. I live, in a, I live in a lost and pathetic generation of people. And we begin to see, when we see ourselves in the light of a holy God, we begin to see the condition of the world around us and their lostness and the fact that there is hopelessness. And the cherubim or the seraphim flew to Isaiah and touched his lips with a coal from the altar and said, your sin has been Remove your iniquity has been taken away and purged. And Isaiah realizes that the only hope for society is that they experience the same thing. Why do we do missions? We do missions because there's a lost world around us that's dying and going to a crisis, eternity, and hell. And they need the purging of a holy, righteous God. It is said that there are 17,409 people groups in the world. These are not individuals. These are people groups, people who speak the same language, who have the same customs, who live somewhat in the same area. Uh, and some of them may have gone to other uh, lands to live, but they basically have the same culture, the la same language, the same religion, uh, even though it may be a false religion. These are people, groups that are identified by their uh, ethnicity and their culture. 17,400 of them. And of those people groups in the world today, over 6,825 have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. They've never been reached with the gospel. They've never been reached with the message that God loves them and died for them. And these people are going to enter hell when they die because they've never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. These are, again, not 6,825 individual people. These are groups of people numbering into the millions that have never heard the gospel message that Jesus loves them. And they're going into a Christless eternity. He said, well, what can I do? Well, 
In 2021, just last year, through the International Mission Board, 3,532 missionaries reached 93 new people groups. 93 out of the 6,825, 93 of those were reached. That's a start. That's a start. And in those 93 people groups, they led 176,795 people to Jesus Christ. 176,795. That's more than 484 people per day over a 365-day period of time. Every single day, 484 people will run to faith in Jesus Christ by the missionaries from the International Mission Board. And of that number, they were able to baptize 107,701 of them. That's more than 295 baptisms every day around the world. And with that number, they started 22,744 new churches. 62 new churches every single day begun beginning to reach the world for Jesus Christ. Have we accomplished the goal? Have we reached all the people groups? No. And that's why we do missions. Has all the world heard the gospel of Jesus Christ? Every nation, every person? No. That's why we do missions. We have people right here in our own nation that have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some of these are from those unreached people groups. And we have the opportunity to share with them. But there is a greater concentration of these unreached people groups on the foreign field. So what are we going to do? What is going to be our response? It should be the same response that Isaiah had. Here am I. Send me. Here am I, Lord. Send me. Isaiah heard the doors rattling and the place shaking. And he said, as he heard the voice, Who am I going to send? Who, who will go for us and tell us and tell the world how much we care and love them? Isaiah said, I'll be one. I realize my sinfulness. I've been purged by the tongs from the altar, the cold from the altar. I've been saved. Now I have a commission to go and to share with those around the world who've never heard that they can have their sins removed as well. Can you go on a short-term mission trip? Maybe you're retired. Maybe you have a couple of weeks vacation that you could take at a time and you could go on a 10-day, two-week mission trip. You say, well, I can't do much in 10 days or two weeks. You'd be surprised at how much you can do in that short amount of time. How much of a blessing you can be to other people. I've had the privilege of going on a couple of those. And each one that I've been able to go on, I have seen God work in miraculous ways. Short period of time, but accomplishing a great amount of work for God. Doing what God has given us to do. Maybe you can't go, but can you give? Can you give something to help others go? Can you give something to help others that are on the mission field? We're starting this month our emphasis on the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. We have a map over here to my right, just above the piano. That, light, that map has 100 lights on it, and each light represents $75 that's been given for missions. This year, I'm not going to wait until the 1st of December to turn on all the lights. We're going to start turning the lights on as soon as we get the money, starting this week. I wonder how long it's going to take us to get that map filled. It's only 100 lights. It's only $75 per light. You give $300, you get to light two lights. Can you give that much? 
How many of us will spend between now and Christmas more than $75 on our family for Thanksgiving and Christmas? By the time we fix the meal for Christmas Day and Thanksgiving Day, by the time we buy our gifts to give to family. Maybe you don't give to family, to, to grown children. Maybe you just give to grandchildren. But how many of us will spend more than $75 on our grandchildren's gifts this year? Would you take that challenge to add up how much you plan to give to each person during the Christmas, Thanksgiving celebrations? Would you add up to that amount how much you'll spend on meals, going out to eat, or other activities that are designed for just the holiday spirit and the holiday season? Will you consider how much you are going to spend and see if you come anywhere near $75? And if you do, would you consider giving a matching amount to missions? That's the only way we can give a gift to Jesus. Because he said, whatsoever you do to one of the least of these, you've done it unto me. So if we want to give a gift to Jesus, the best way to do that is to give through missions, to give to others. There are some who bemoan the fact that with Operation Shoebox that we'll be dedicating this morning, that you have to put $10 in there. I remember when it was just 7 and people complained then. $10 a box? Wow, that's robbery. What do they do with $10 for a box? Oh, well, shit. Have you ever tried to ship anything lately? Have you ever tried to buy Bibles to put in those boxes and other literature? What about the gospel booklets that they put in there to help the child come to faith in Jesus Christ? Is a child's faith worth $10? What if that child takes that box home and shares the information he receives and the testament with his family, with his brothers and sisters, is $10 worth the salvation of a whole family? Is $10 worth the salvation of an entire village? Can you even begin to put a price on the salvation of a soul? And yet we oftentimes in our abundance begrudge the giving of the little things to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you can't go on a mission trip, how much can you give to advance the cause of missions, to help build schools and hospitals and purchase automobiles for missionaries to travel in and supplies for them to use, Bibles for them to distribute in the native language of the people to whom they're ministering. These are just some of the things that the Lottie Moon Christmas offering gifts are used for. Can you go? Can you give? Can you at least pray? Can you pray daily for these missionaries that are on the field? Pray for their protection. Some of them are working in places where if it was discovered that they are there for the primary purpose of evangelizing the people, could be put to death, not just in prison, put to death because they're advancing the cause of Jesus Christ. And they have to go into those countries under cover of doing something else. Could you pray for their protection? Could you pray that the missionaries have wisdom of where to go and with whom to speak? Because some of them may speak to people who would turn them in to the government and lead to their arrest and death. Pray for their wisdom. Pray for their health. They live, many of them, in unsafe environments uh, for their 
uh, general hygiene and safety. Prayed for their health from malaria and other diseases. Pray for opportunities to witness every day. As you're praying your prayers, pray that the missionaries might have opportunities to share their faith that day and to open the hearts of the people to whom they share. Pray for their children. Some of these missionaries not only have to say goodbye to family and friends in America and sail to far distant places to serve as missionaries, but there may come a time that they have to say goodbye to their children as their children are sent to a boarding school somewhere else outside of the village where they are for schooling. Pray for their children and their safety and protection and their education. There's so many things for which we can pray. We can go, we can give, and all of us can pray. Are you willing to say, here am I, send me? What God is looking for for today is for people who will say, Lord, you have your own way in my life. You do whatever it is you want to do in my life. Here am I. Send me. Would you pray with me? Father, here we are. The question is, are we willing to say, send us? Are we willing to say, have your own way, Lord? Have your own way. You're the potter. We're the clay. Mold us and make us after your will. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Move in our hearts right now and bring us to that point of conviction where we're willing to say, Lord Jesus, here am I. Send me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.